hot take. The two greatest Bond girls of all time are Mariam Dabo in The Living Daylights and Isabella Skorupko in GoldenEye. By greatest, I am not saying these are my favorites or the most iconic or the most beautiful. Iconic has to go to Ursula Andress and Honor Blackman, and most beautiful is personal opinion, though it could extend to actresses with thankless roles like Jill St. John or, or Britt Eklund. When I say greatest, I mean that Dabo's Kara and Skorupko's Natalia are the most interesting and fleshed out women in the long history of Bond films. I I love Barbara Bach and the spy who loved me, but she's basically just a super spy and snarky competition with Bond. And her whole character arc is deciding whether or not she should hook up with Bond or kill him. So while Barbara Bach is close to my favorite, her storyline shows up again in Moonraker, Tomorrow Never Dies, and Die Another Day, with varying degrees of success. Kara, the heroine of The Living Daylights, starts as a classical cellist who's been bullied into a job for the KGB by her boyfriend, a slimy Russian general named Georgi Koskov. She's set up to look like a KGB sniper, but Bond refuses to kill her because he realizes that she's just a pawn in some yeah. shifty game. Kara begins the movie as a scared pawn, a puppet for her evil boyfriend. Koskov has provided her with luxurious gifts like a Stradivarius cello. She's essentially a kept woman, but she's invested enough in Koskov to lay her life on the line for him in his Cold War games. Koskov disappears. Bond is never above manipulating those who are already manipulated, so he meets up with Kara and promises to reunite her with Koskov, who Bond is actually hunting down. The two travel together from Bratislava to Vienna to Tangier and eventually Afghanistan. But, as Bond and Kara travel together, avoiding the Czech police, and then goofing around at the Prater Fair in Vienna, a genuine warmth builds between the spy and the cellist. It's a warmth that Bond movies rarely achieve. Kara is no Tracy Bond or Vesper Lind, and Bond and Kara's relationship feels honestly a little paternal. He's sheltering this woman from forces beyond her scope. But you do get the feeling that Bond is motivated for once by genuine compassion, not quite by his mission or his need to get laid, and what begins as a spy versus spy cat and mouse game against Georgi Koskov turns into a relationship. Kara gives as good as she gets. She insists on delaying their escape from Bratislava long enough to grab her cello, which eventually saves their lives. She poisons Bond when she thinks that he's betraying her and Koskov, and when Bond tries to pack her off to a safe cave with the Mujahideen, she calls him a horse's ass. And bit by bit, we see her grow in confidence despite the insane things that are happening around her. All of this leads up to her delivering the most badass scene in this movie. There's nothing more I can do. Yes, there is. <laughs> This KGB pawn, the scared cellist, is now leading a Mujahideen raid against a Soviet base in Afghanistan, and I completely buy it. And that's what puts Mariam Dabo near the top of my list for Bond girls. Very few, maybe none, have a character arc like this. Now, for Isabella Skorupko, there have been at least a dozen Bond movies where the producers say, it's a woman, but she's Bond's equal. Bond's equal? An equal. And usually, it's okay. Sometimes, it's awful. Some are written well, like Wei Lin or Holly Goodhead. I'm looking for Dr. Goodhead. You just found her. A woman. Your powers of observation do you credit, Mr. Bond. And then it comes down to your opinion about the actress. Some start well, like Anya Anasova or Tiffany Case, but then fizzle into damsel in distress mode for no discernible reason. Some are both written and acted appallingly. Who sent you? Your mama. Like Holly Berry's Jinx or Christmas Jones. The producers just keep saying, Bones equal. An equal. And they fail to deliver most of the time. Lashana Lynch comes pretty close. And if you cut off the finale of The Spy Who Loved Me, Barbara Bach would have been number one. I don't know why I can't get behind Lois Childs. Maybe it's because her movie is Moonraker or because Roger Moore is such a sexist bitch in that film that I just don't want to see Bond's equal. I just want to see Bond get kicked in the by contrast, Skorupko's Natalia is never competing with Bond. She's excellent at being who she is. She's a person with a completely unrelated skill set. If anything, she's competing with Alan Cummings' Boris, a fellow hacker. 
She survives a horrific attack that kills all of her co-workers, and then she continues on with aplomb. When locked up in a soon-to-explode train car with Bond, she snaps at him to let her complete her work. It's not the irritating 90s trope of strong women just being snarky. She's laying out the groundwork. You do your job, I will do my job. Bond can get them physically out of this trap, but Natalia can dig up the next clue and save the world. In a movie that sometimes, <coughs> money penny, gives on-the-nose apologies for the Bond series prior to sexism. After you, money penny. No, I insist. You first. Natalia never falls into the trap of insufferable meta-commentary, and there's something fantastic about a Bond movie that leaves its main female co-star in a frumpy cardigan for most of its runtime. Skrupko is very beautiful, but aside from a fleeting glimpse of her in a sarong in Cuba, she's pretty much dressed like an office programmer throughout. By the end of the film, Natalia saves James Bond's life at least three times, and while Bond is off seeking revenge against Sean Bean, she's saving the world. Now here's my prejudice. I would love it if Hollywood could get past the Angelina Jolie, Kate Beckinsale, Mia Jovovich trope of women being badass equating to soulless, humorless perfection. With all due respect to all three of those actors, because they've shown their chops outside of the action sphere, once they're in an action movie, personality goes out the window, and I blame the studios for that. Lashana Lynch and Anita Armas both rule in No Time to Die because the actors are both great and because their gender is not important to the story. I have been happy to see Scarlett Johansson's Black Widow grow into an interesting character after her bland initial roles in Iron Man 2 and the Avengers, I suspect the actress herself was responsible for pushing things in a more interesting direction. But that all comes a full 30 years after GoldenEye and 35 since The Living Daylights. Maybe Kara and Natalia delight me so much because they showed up so long before Hollywood got its head on straight, and both Mariam Dabo and Isabella Skorupko are great in their roles. I am grateful for them. But then, you know, they'd tell you about this country you're in, and they'd say you can't go past a certain area because there are landmines still that have not been cleared. And there are hospitals everywhere where kids are still being affected by these things. You know, and you think about Hollywood when you realize when you're out there how tiny this business and, and, this, and this place is. What is the scene we're going to see here? Do you know, this is a scene from... Uh... Oh, and this is Tomb Raider. <laughs> right.